Hello, this is Michael Altos, and we are recording the final installment of our lecture series. This is Antimicrobial Agents, and today we are doing part... All right, so before we talk about agents, there are some principles that we'd like to discuss. First of all, just basic principles of antibiotic therapy. In the operating room, most commonly, we're giving antimicrobial agents to prevent infections. They're prophylactic antibiotics either a, a surgical site infection or a wound infection. And sometimes we give antibiotics to treat a known or suspected infection, usually for uh, unscheduled cases. We need to be aware of the toxicity of these different antibiotics, any allergic reactions that people can have. And these are principles we need to keep in mind as we discuss these agents today. I want to go over a variety of different concepts uh, as a means of introduction. The first is the difference between bacteriostatic and bactericidal antibiotics. Bacteriostatic antibiotics simply stop the bacteria from growing and reproducing. Usually they disrupt the reproductive mechanism of the bacteria, either by disrupting protein formation or DNA synthesis. Bactericidal medications actually kill the existing bacteria. As you can imagine, these are better choices for people who are critically ill or immunocompromised, and these are usually our best choices for perioperative antibiotics. We want to really sterilize the uh, area of concern as much as possible. And most of these drugs work at the cell wall or cell membrane by disrupting the integrity of the bacterial structure. Another concept to be aware of is the spectrum of the antibiotic. Narrow spectrum antibiotics are effective to as much a degree as possible against only the bacteria of concern, whereas broad-spectrum antibiotics are more of a shotgun approach and they kill many, many different kinds of bacteria. The biggest problem with broad-spectrum antibiotics is there will be more effects on the other normal bacteria that live in your body and they can upset the balance of normal flora in your GI tract and other parts of the body. When we dose antibiotics, our goal is to achieve a minimum inhibitory concentration. This is the serum concentration that you need to achieve in order to kill the bacteria of interest. When you underdose antibiotics, you may actually be only killing the weakest bacteria, and the stronger bacteria are selected out, so to speak, to continue reproducing. The only time when it might be appropriate to underdose bacteria, uh, underdose antibiotics, would be in people who have hepatic or renal dysfunction and have a metabolic concern. I think all of you have had some college level biology, so I will just quickly review the principles of the gram stain, which is a certain dye that can identify properties of the cell wall. This image just shows the cell wall. Um, here is the phospholipid bilayer, which is the cell membrane, and um, the rest of the cell wall is made of this big peptidoglycan, and this is what a gram-positive bacteria looks like. A gram-negative bacteria's cell wall is more complicated. It has an inner membrane and an outer membrane, again made of this lipid bilayer, and a very narrow peptidoglycan in the middle. So why is this significant? Because gram-positive bacteria with that thick peptidoglycan layer are more susceptible to antibiotics and antibodies. And actually, a lot of the gram-positive bacteria are normal bacteria. They are uh, exist in our bodies, and we're exposed to them all the time. And they don't often cause a lot of disease normally. These are the bacillus and the clostridium bacteria, enterococcus, staph, and strep. And we compare these with the gram-negative bacteria. These uh, bugs, because of their outer membrane, are more resistant to antibiotics and to normal uh, immune response with antibodies. These are often the bacteria that make us sick. And these are things we see in food poisoning and in other infections like Campylobacter, Chlamydia, Enterobacter, E. coli, Klebsiella, Neisseria, Pseudomonas, and Salmonella, just to name a selection. Another way of classifying bacteria is to think of them as aerobic or anaerobic. And for the purpose of this list, again, I'm not a microbiologist and I don't intend to make you into one, 
So this is a very, very simplified slide. But we can think of certain bacteria that require oxygen to live. and are the, These are the aerobes. Certain bacteria that could grow with or without oxygen. These are facultative anaerobes. And certain oxygen, certain bacteria that are obligate anaerobes, which means they can only grow in the absence of oxygen. So the aerobes are things like Bacillus and Pseudomonas. The facultative anaerobes, which are often found in whoops, in the skin or the nose, the oropharynx, the sinus, the GI tract. These include some gram positives like Staph and Strep, Pneumococcus, Enterococcus, and C. difficile, and some gram negatives like E. coli, Klebsiella, and Salmonella. And then we have the obligate anaerobes, which require an oxygen-free environment, and related to them, the microaerophiles, which require a very low oxygen environment. We often find these in the GI tract and the genitalia. These would include gram positives like Clostridium, and gram negatives like Neisseria and Helicobacter. So that's our basic introduction. If you have questions, please feel free to contact me. And now we will move on to more of a discussion about adverse reactions. The most common adverse reaction that people think of is allergy. People can be allergic to any drug and any antibiotic. Beta-lactams especially have a reputation for precipitating allergic reaction. An allergy is usually an immune-mediated an immune -mediated reaction, which means only a little bit needs to be exposed to the body, and the immune system kicks in and triggers a snowball effect, leading to anything from rash and itching all the way to bronchospasm and anaphylaxis. Even a tiny test dose can trigger an allergic reaction. Related to this is what we call a non-immune-mediated histamine release. There are certain drugs that cause histamine to be released and the more drug you give, the more histamine is released. It may be dependent on the dose or on the rate of administration. The reactions can be just like the allergic reactions, rash, itching, bronchospasm, flushing, and even anaphylaxis. In fact, this used to be called an anaphylactoid reaction, which is not really a current term. Now you would just call it a non-immune mediated anaphylactic reaction. And vancomycin, with its red man syndrome, is a classic example of this non-immune-mediated histamine release. There are lots of other adverse reactions that people may describe with antibiotics. Fever, phlebitis, and many other reactions that we will describe. Antibiotics can disturb electrolyte balances, especially sodium balance. They can, they can uh, augment neuromuscular blockade, especially the aminoglycosides. And this can be an issue in postoperative weakness or in patients who have underlying neuromuscular disease. Many antibiotics cause GI upset, and this can be due either to um, a direct effect on the GI tract, causing nausea and vomiting or diarrhea, or it may be due to killing off regular normal flora that exist in the body, allowing overgrowth of normal flora that are normally kept in check. So for example, yeast like candida and C. difficile exist in small but controlled amounts in our bodies, and when certain normal flora are killed, these bacteria tend to overgrow and cause disease. And some of these antibiotics can be toxic. We can have ototoxicity due to aminoglycosides and vancomycin, nephrotoxicity from aminoglycosides and perhaps vancomycin, teratogenicity, damage to a fetus from a number of different antibiotics, which is not a surprise since these drugs target DNA synthesis and cell reproduction. And finally, we may have some drug interactions, often involving the cytochrome P450 system, or altering the protein binding of other medications in the system. Again, if you have questions, please make note of them. And now we continue with the discussion about our approach to antibiotics in the surgical and the perioperative setting. There's something out there called SCIP, the Surgical Care Improvement Project, which has a number of different benchmarks to define quality in the perioperative period, and one of them involves antimicrobial prophylaxis. The intention is that we 
administer an antibiotic just before incision in order to achieve the lowest rate of surgical site infection. And if you give the antibiotic too early or after incision, the risk of infection increases. We also want to use the best antibiotic, something that is as narrow as possible, targeting the most likely organisms to cause the problem. And finally, we want to maintain effective and adequate antibiotic levels in tissue the entire time the surgery is going on. And most of the time, we're giving antibiotics just prior to incision. The official guideline is that antibiotics should be given within one hour before surgical incision. Within 30 minutes is probably better. On the other hand, three seconds before incision is probably not ideal. And so ideally around the 15 to 30 minute mark prior to incision is the best time to give antibiotics so that peak tissue concentrations can be achieved. And then the antibiotics need to be redosed according to published guidelines based on the half-life of the drug, the metabolism of the patient, as well as how much blood loss there's been. There are certain procedures which are considered clean and do not require antibiotics, and it would be a skip violation to give antibiotics in these cases. And almost all the time, we are targeting normal bacteria that exist on the surface of the skin or in the GI or genital urinary tract. This table is only an example of skip guidelines, and the guidelines change, so I don't make any promises that this table is current, and you should check with your institution to get the current recommendations. But this just shows that on a skip table, you can look up the kind of surgery you're doing, say, for example, a C-section, and then you can find out what the preferred drug is. Here it's cefoxetin, and what some alternatives would be if the patient has an allergy to cefoxetin. That's the end of this recording, and we will continue with the discussion of antibiotics in the next section.